Here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this sad little planet under so much strain. Welcome to this UNAC sponsored webinar. Um, as I said earlier, in case you missed it, it is being live streamed on the unacpeace.org website, on YouTube, and on the UNAC Facebook page. We are at a critical stage in terms of climate change and the development of a military arms race in space. You can help broadcast this message by sharing this webinar on your own social media pages, amongst your friends, on email, or however you choose. COP26 is grinding to its predictable carbon fueled end. We mustn't take our eyes off the ball and we mustn't take our eyes off the space above us, which is threatened. We didn't manage to stop climate change. We didn't get ourselves active quick enough. With the space militarization, maybe there's a chance. So let's think about that. We face a future of hypersonic weapons, machine made decisions, far and forget situations. Let's not allow this to happen. So our three speakers today are very knowledgeable on all the subjects we concern ourselves with. And I'd like to start today with Dave Webb, who is speaking today from the UK, from Leeds. He is the chair of CND, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. He is a board chair of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. He has also devised peace and conflict studies and he continues to work on this subject of demilitarization and weaponization in space and around us. Dave, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction <coughs> and uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, I'm just going to share my screen for the uh, PowerPoint. Is that okay? Can you see that? Yeah, okay. Um, so let me just start by saying that when I was a kid, I became really interested in astronomy and all things space. You only have to look up at the night sky, really, to see um, how wondrous it is and want to know more about it. So I went on eventually to study physics and learned how through closely observing those little pinpoints of light, we've been able to extract an incredible amount of information about space objects, planets, stars, galaxies, and so on. And now just by looking at the light from the stars, we've discovered how they shine, how they're born, how they grow old and actually eventually die even. And it's an example of human ingenuity and intelligence and how discoveries have been made by scientists from different nations, sharing their knowledge and working together. And satellite systems have been developed to help study and map the Earth's environment and help understand the weather and climate change and monitor such things as the effects of pollution and effects on agricultural patterns. And others are helping with communications and a whole range of human activities. Well, this all sounds very positive, but I've also come to discover after a few years that you don't get told some of the other things that are happening in space and that space us users are predominantly now commercial and a major player in the development of space technologies is the military and space is getting crowded. This shows, this graph shows the number of launches by country during the uh, <coughs> space age leading up to the moon landing in 1969. After that, the launch numbers started to drop a bit, but then started up again when commercial interest took over. That's the green part of the, of the graph. Those are the private or commercial enterprises. 
Many of those commercial launches will also be used by the military, of course, for sort of dual use programs. In 2020, for example, there was a total of 114 launches from 21 different launch sites with 10 failures. So not everything is perfect. Also in 2021, this year, 1,283 satellites were placed in orbit, the highest number launched in a year so far, although this number will be overtaken easily as time goes on. At the end of April 2000, uh, 2021, there was a total of 7,389 satellites in space, of which only around 3,368 are still active. The importance of outer space and the vital roles it plays was recognized very early on in the development of space travel and was the reason that the Outer Space Treaty on principles governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, was developed at the United Nations in 1967. The treaty recognizes outer space as a global commons, stating that the exploration of space uh, shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries and shall be the province of all humankind. Now, though, the dependency on space and the rapid development of space technologies are running out of control. Competition and money have become controlling factors and we're experiencing what's called a tragedy of, of the commons, where major users with open access to space and who are unconcerned about any rules that govern access and use are acting according to them, to their own self-interests and contrary to the common good of all. The Outer Space Treaty was proposed to preserve the space environment, but with the rapid growth of the space industry, problems are arising for the environment on Earth, and these problems are escalating. The space budgets of the main spacefaring nations gives a clue as to where the push for space is coming from. The US, China, Russia, France, and India are the major spacefarers with the European community too. And a sizable slice of these budgets involves supporting the further militarization of space. The number of space forces around the, the world is growing and so are their budgets. In 2020, the total global annual expenditure was over $28 billion, a considerable amount of money. And space launches and the use of satellites has expanded rapidly to areas that are not beneficial to everyone. And while some seek to explore and explain, others are now looking to exploit and dominate. Billionaires and their corporations are seeking to exploit space and develop space tourism and extract valuable resources from the asteroids and planets. Elon Musk is even looking to colonize the moon or Mars once the Earth has been exhausted and made unlivable. The military simply want to dominate and control the ultimate high ground. The US Space Command made it clear in their vision for 2020 some years ago now that their aim is to become dominant in the full spectrum of military activity on land, sea, air and space and information. <clears throat> and they have created <coughs> satellite systems for monitoring and surveillance, communications and control, global positioning, drone operations, missile defense systems, missile targeting and guidance. But the launching of rockets to launch these satellites into space is also producing environmental problems, polluting the ground with fuel and exhaust fumes. Rockets are different types, use different types of fuels, and so their exhaust fumes will also differ. Some rockets use solid fuels, some many, and many use a mixture of kerosene and liquid oxygen, while others use liquid hydrogen or other more complex compounds. Blue Origin and NASA are a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen fuel mix. Of course, considerable amounts of carbon dioxide are released from the development and manufacture of rockets and also from the production, the storing and burning of the rocket fuels. In 2005, 
there were reports that levels of percolate in breast milk and vegetables were high in many areas near launch sites and indications were that rockets were contaminating water supplies. Perchlorates have been linked to thyroid ailments and are considered particularly dangerous to children. The important emissions of concern with respect to global impacts are chlorine and alumina particles from solid rocket motors and soot particles, also known as black carbon, mainly, though not exclusively, from kerosene fueled engines as used by SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. Black carbon and alumina particles also end up in the stratosphere, a region important for weather, and because they're so small, they stay there for three to four years and build up. Chemical reactions involving chlorine <coughs> and the surface of alumina particles cause losses in the stratospheric ozone layer that protects us from harmful ultraviolet rays from the sun. Shuttle launches of the past and the Apollo era Saturn V vehicles use liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen and NASA's new space launch systems use liquid hydrogen as a fuel which produces water vapor, another greenhouse gas. Rocket launches have been assumed to be not too much of a threat to the global environment in the past because the space industry was small and unchanging. However, today's rapid growth and the threat of expanding space tourism and transportation systems coupled with the lack of research and oversight is causing much concern among scientists, environmentalists and citizen groups. The increase in activity in space is also creating huge amounts of debris. The European Space Agency has estimated that there are roughly 166 million man-made mad objects in space, ranging in size from one millimeter to the size of a refrigerator. As launch numbers rise, and as tens of thousands of satellites with a limited lifetime are placed in orbit, the problem is going to increase in significantly, significantly, not insignificantly, and could uh, even eventually prevent spacecraft from leaving the Earth altogether. And now space corporations such as SpaceX are planning to establish networks of thousands of satellites to provide super fast 5G networks for global broadband coverage that will also have military applications for communications and will increase surveillance and targeting capabilities. This huge number of new satellites in orbit is set to dramatically change the night sky. Astronomers in particular are concerned their work requires long exposure photographs of the night sky and this is being hampered by satellite trails. <clears throat> in addition, uh, launch accidents are not that uncommon, uncommon as we mentioned earlier on. And when they occur, they create a considerable amount of environmental destruction and contamination. Elon Musk's SpaceX company has a test, fly, fail, fix, repeat attitude to its space program. So his belief is that failure is part of the process, irrespective of its effects on the environment. And they just start again after an accident. And the increase in satellite launches and the race to benefit from the profits is bringing about an increase in places to launch from. New spaceports are being established around the world and their construction is often opposed by local residents concerned about the effects on their environment and the destruction of local ecologies. Communities are being promised income and jobs, but those hosting existing launch sites have experienced disruption and vast ecological damage. Nuclear power in space <coughs> is also now being re-promoted by the military, especially. But nuclear generators for planetary bases or rocket propulsion create environmental problems from the mining of the uranium to the deployment on spacecraft or on celestial bodies. 
And what, <clears throat> what if there's an accident at launch that could spread deadly nuclear material far and wide around the globe? Interest in the development of nukes in space is perhaps more to do with being able to power space weapons. It is the Pentagon that have been doing most of the pushing. Establishing bases or even landing on celestial bodies can also bring contamination by dangerous substances or bacteria, such as the Europeans brought when they brought sickness to the new world. And now the moons and the planets of our solar system are on the verge of being exploited by mining corporations. In 2015, President Obama signed the so-called space law approved by the US Congress to allow US companies to exploit, to exploit space mining and the appropriation of asteroids and their other space resources. Mining activities in space would produce waste deposits on celestial bodies or aggravate environmental problems on Earth and perpetuate the wasteful use of resources. So what do we do in space or whatever we do in space and whether we explore or exploit relies on a few people making the right choices. And it's going to be up to us to ensure that they do. At one of the Global Networks conferences on space use and ethics held in Darmstadt, Germany in 1999, the mathematician and physicist Jürgen Schäfrin, now a professor at the University of Hamburg, spoke on the peaceful and sustainable use of space and developed a set of criteria for assessing the use of space technology to ensure that it has social, social, social tool acceptance costs and resources, goals and benefits. He suggested these eight criteria for the assessment of future space projects. And these criteria can also be applied to other fields of technology. So to exclude the possibility of severe catastrophe, avoid military use, violent conflict and proliferation, minimize adverse effects on health and environment, assure a scientific, scientific technical quality, functionality, reliability, solve problems and satisfy needs in a sustainable and timely manner, seek alternatives with best cost effective effectiveness and guarantee social compatibility and strengthen cooperation. Justify projects in a public debate involving those concerned. Hardly any of these criteria are actually followed at the moment. Uh, but I would suggest that these are the ones we need to follow and perhaps even more strictly now than uh, <clears throat> now that the earth is really in danger from climate change. So join us uh, as the many and the many other people around the world who are doing what they can to keep space for peace. Please join or have a look at the Global Network website, which is www.spaceforpeace if you haven't done so already and uh, keep, keep, keep tuning in and keep involved with the many activities that we're, we're uh, initiating. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. I'll stop thank sharing. Thank you, this. thank you very much, Dave. That was absolutely stunning and horrifying, of course. And I think probably everybody will agree that barely one syllable of that is seen or heard on our mainstream media. So it's up to us to keep informing and reinforming each other as to what is going on. Um, a reminder for anyone who has joined us recently, um, this is a UNAC sponsored event. It is being live streamed on Facebook on the UNAC page and on YouTube. And also for those who have to leave early, we will be sending out a link to the recording of this in an email, hopefully tomorrow. Right, well, um, to follow Dave, uh, we are very glad to have with us Kuhan Pikemander. Kuhan grew up in post-war Korea, and she served as a campaign director of the Asia Pacific Programme at the International Forum of Globalization. She is a board member of the Global Network. 
and she is also on the campaign group of Climate is Not Our Enemy in the Code Pink organization. So Kuan, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and also to remind participants that please put questions for our panelists in the, the Q&A section of the, um, of the Zoom link. Okay, thank you, Kuhan, this is over to you. Thank you so much, Pippa, and thank you, Joe Lombardo as well, and also UNEC for sponsoring this event. I just wanna make a slight correction. The name of the Code Pink campaign that I'm on the working group for is China is not our enemy, not climate is not our enemy, but I like that. Um, anyway, the military space and climate, there are a lot of implications there that haven't been really thought about by very many people at all. First of all, what we do know is that the US military is the largest single institutional consumer of fossil fuels in the world, as well as the largest emitter of carbon in the world. Uh, its, its carbon emissions exceed those of a hundred other nations combined, which is quite astonishing. And so now we've just come out of the COP26 and we've seen a lot of lip service, right, to addressing climate, the climate crisis. The Biden administration has said that they are committed to slashing carbon emissions. And we've got the Pentagon uh, acknowledging all the criticism and saying that they will transition to all electric vehicles as well as biofuels for their aircraft, trucks, and um, ships. However, what is not figuring into this climate calculus is that it will not stop them from doing so much destruction. And I am going to share screen now. Uh, may I have the ability to share screen, please? Anyone? Okay, uh, I think I got it. You should the ability now. Okay, Sorry. very good. No problem. So what all, as I was saying, what all these climate calculations do not take into consideration is that it won't stop the Pentagon from decimating populations of whales and dolphins or killing coral reefs and coastal ecosystems. And our planet's oxygen supply is inextricably linked to the health of marine ecosystems. When coral reefs, co coastal ecosystems, and rainforests are killed, it sets off a cascade of systems failures. Coral, plankton, algae, trees, and the soil biome that would otherwise be capturing carbon and producing oxygen are destroyed. But as far as the Pentagon is concerned, the eco side will go on. So, so what if the ships are running on biofuels? As long as the, as long as the military, you know, I'm going to be switching back and forth or I could just stay on share screen, but um, as long as the military's agenda is to continue to dominate ocean, sea, land, outer space, then it really doesn't matter if biofuels and electric vehicles are playing into it because the Pentagon will continue to crush the, the planet's inherent ability to regenerate itself in the face of climate catastrophe. And to make matters worse, the Pentagon is now engaged in this enormous paradigm shift that will require a series of so-called smart grids to enclose planet Earth in 5G and sonar. And it's a new way of war. It's a new way that war will be waged, which is what this infrastructure that is being installed um, is all about. Now.
In this new way of waging war, earthbound mission control centers are moving into space. Brick and mortar facilities are moving to the cloud. The military base manned with thousands of troops and armed with tanks and machine guns, like what we saw in Afghanistan, is now passe, which may explain why the US withdrew from that old school war so hastily and without finesse. The military base is being replaced by what has been called a high kill, a high speed kill web. It uses information as the primary weapon of war. It will enable empire to summon at once unmanned military forces to rain terror down on any spot of the world. A swarm of drones, hypersonic missiles, submarine torpedoes, and bombers, and all with the ease of calling an Uber. This is why demonizing China is so essential. Only a foe as formidable and distant as China would justify the hyper-costly infrastructure overhaul required. War with China, and by extension, war with its ally Russia as well, requires the U.S. to pour far more resources into military fantasies than that which would be required by the usual bombing of a small third world country. These high tech profits will make the money made by Halliburton during the 20 years in Afghanistan look like peanuts. In order to build this infrastructure for this new way of war, reefs are being dredged and forests are being raised throughout Asia and the Pacific. An ambitious system of missile deployment facilities, satellite launch pads, radar tracking stations, aircraft carrier ports, live fire training areas, and other facilities for satellite controlled war are being erected to embody the next century of industrial scale institutional violence. The new infrastructure will include a grid of thousands of satellites launched into the heavens. It will also be comprised of a grid throughout the Indo-Pacific made up of mini bases such as airstrips and launch pads on as many islands as possible, indicated by the red circles here. And on the surface of the ocean, it will be a grid of 5G devices. Underwater, it will be a grid of sonar devices. Here's a drone loaded with sono buoys that will be dropped into the ocean. Sonar devices like these will transmit whale killing sonar signals to 5G sensors on the ocean surface. The 5G sensors will then relay the signals to satellite and land receivers. Just to give you an idea of how lethal sonar is to whales, when low frequency active sonar is activated in Hawaii, it has made the sperm whales all the way in Australia stop eating for two days. This is how fatally disruptive sonar is to whales and dolphins. It is equally detrimental for mating, birthing, hunting and voyaging. Saturating the ocean with sonar will kill our oceans. Nonetheless, this marine holocaust has been cynically dubbed the smart ocean. Here is an unmanned helicopter loaded with sono buoys that will also be dropped into the ocean. The idea is to overlay the entire planet with several layers of grids that will transform the planet into a real life 3D chessboard. It is all part of a master plan called the Joint All Domain Command and Control or JADC2. At the heart of the JADC2 is a data storage cloud called JEDI, now in development by Amazon and Microsoft, 
which happens to be one of the sponsors of the COP26. Other cloud companies such as Google, Oracle, and IBM have a chance to also win a slice of this deal worth tens of billions of dollars. The inaugural exercises to help develop this new gridded warfare were completed last summer in Hawaii. The new technology linked Navy and Marine Corps, sea, air, land, space, and cyber weapons spanning 17 time zones. Troops practiced blowing lots of things up in Hawaii's marine habitats by clicking on their laptops at Pearl Harbor, which we see here. In one size, Marines on Oahu struck a ship and sank it with missiles launched from a robot truck off the coast of the neighbor island of Kauai. The oceans sequester an astonishing 2 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. Okay, 2 billion metric tons per year. Just to give you a point of comparison, for the 16 years between 2001 and 2017, the US military emitted 1.2 billion metric tons of carbon in those 16 years. So in only one year, the oceans sequestered almost double that output by the Pentagon. Absolutely astonishing. Now, much of this sequestration is due to the presence of whales. Whales are absolutely essential to the ecological resilience of our oceans. And as such, whales are the primary species for mitigating and delaying climate catastrophe. Marine biologist Asha DeVos has done much research on how whales do this. As whales dive to the depths to feed and come up to the surface to breathe, they actually release enormous fecal plumes. This whale pump, as it's called by scientists, brings essential nutrients from the depths to the surface waters where they stimulate the growth of phytoplankton that forms the base of all marine food chains. Because of phyto phytoplankton photosynthesis, the oceans generate more oxygen than all the rainforests of the world combined. This is especially important now and true because forests have begun emitting more carbon than they are capturing. In fact, 10 UNESCO World Heritage Site forests are releasing more carbon than they are absorbing. This alarming development places ever more importance on our oceans to function truly as the lungs of the planet. Now, once whales die, even then they're sequestering carbon. Their carcasses transport, their carcasses transport carbon to the deep oceans. Every year, it's estimated that whale carcasses transport 190,000 tons of carbon to the bottom of the sea. That's the same amount of carbon produced by 80,000 cars per year. Now, one of the most ecocidal developments of modern warfare is this delusionary need for perpetual year-round military practice in our oceans. We essentially have non-stop war now taking place in our oceans, even with no war officially being waged. But a war is being waged. That is a war on all the living spirits that populate the undersea community and enable our oceans to support life on earth. The whales, dolphins, turtles, crabs, seahorses, jellyfish, algae, seaweed, eels, plankton, manta rays, and coral. Naval exercises are the cause of tens of thousands of whale and dolphin deaths per year. Pentagon EISs estimate that the number of injuries and deaths caused by war practice around the Mariana Islands alone, 
will add up to about 150,000 individuals for the 12 years between 2015 and 2027. This is an ongoing, continuing process. They estimate that the number of injuries or deaths of whales and dolphins that took place in the Gulf of Alaska was over 182,000 over a five-year period. Because there are hundreds of naval exercises, not just in the Marianas, not just in Alaska, but throughout the Indo-Pacific, which covers an entire half of the planet, a whole hemisphere, because of these hundreds of naval exercises that are also increasing as we sell more arms to our so-called ally nations, we can easily extrapolate that the number of fatally injured whales and dolphins to be around 100,000 per year. And that's not even counting the devastating impacts that will take place once the smart ocean is installed and operating. The U.S., I'm going to go back to um, stop share. So I don't know if you can see me, but the U.S. is essentially organizing the global economy around militarism. It seems to think it can do this while simultaneously addressing the climate crisis, but that is not possible. You cannot have it both ways. The only path forward toward a livable future is quite obvious. It is climate cooperation between all the nations, between the U.S. and China, because the people of the world, you and me, all of us who we need to organize and stop this madness, we do not want a weaponized Pacific. We do not want a weaponized ocean. We do not want weaponized outer space. We want space for peace. We want peace. We want life. And as I close, I would like to remind us all that the word Pacific means peace. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kuhan. That was terrible and brilliant at the same time. I think many of us will have heard things we have not heard before. Um, and in many ways, you've answered many of the questions I had which about what was going on under the ocean. Um, just to remind people if they have questions, um, that there is a Q&A section if you look at the bottom of your screen. Um, the, uh, the next speaker we have today is Bruce Gagnon, who I always pronounce slightly wrong, I know that, sorry Bruce. Um, the uh, he's the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, um, which is uh, a co-host of this particular webinar together with UNAC. UNAC are recording this and will send you a recording tomorrow or soon uh, once this has been finished. Um, Bruce is based in the US. He's been working on space issues for some 35 years, maybe longer. He started getting interested during the Reagan era when Reagan announced Star Wars in 1982. In 1999, he has um, earned uh, uh, the accolade of being the eighth most censored story of that year, which I think shows just how unpopular the real world thinks people with the facts and figures to put us straight think we are. But to compensate, he was also awarded the Dr. Benjamin Spock Peacemaker Award in 2006. So thank you, Bruce. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pippa, and thank you uh, also to uh, UNAC for allowing us to speak and appreciate everyone that's joined the uh, call today. I'm going to talk about nuclear power and space in much more detail. The United States has been launching nuclear devices into space since the early 1960s, uh, powered by uranium and plutonium 
over the years, there have been a number of accidents. Uh, one of the most famous accidents was SNAP 9A, a US nuclear uh, re uh, reactor on board of a, uh, a military satellite that fell back to earth, burned up on reentry and spread the uh, deadly plutonium 238 as dust by the winds carried across the earth. Dr. John Goffman, one of the founders of uranium uh, at Lawrence Livermore Labs in California studied that particular accident and believes it's one of the reasons for the increase in cancers around the earth today. This was one of the early designs of a nuclear reactor called the Nerva uh, rocket. Uh, you can see that uh, it was quite huge. Um, fortunately, it never flew. This book uh, was a uh, congressional study commissioned by the Congress of the United States. The forward of it to, uh, was signed by the likes of former Senator John Glenn, an astronaut, uh, former Senator Bill Nelson from Florida, and a host of other uh, politicians from both parties talking about what was needed to control and dominate space in the coming years. But just one bit I would like, uh, starting on the left side near the bottom, nuclear reactors thus remain the only known long-lived compact source able to supply military space forces with electric power. Uh, then down just a little further in yellow, larger versions could meet multi-megawatt needs Onto the next page of space-based lasers, neutral particle beams, mass drivers, and rail guns. Nuclear reactors must support major bases on the moon until better options yet identified become available. And then down just a little further, safety factors rather than technological feasibility will remain the principal impediment to nuclear power in space unless officials convince influential critics that risks are acceptably low. This is the Death Star, what the Pentagon uh, has named the space-based laser that has under, been under development for some years. They say it would be powered with nuclear reactors in space. Just recently, NASA has announced the uh, development of nuclear reactors for rockets in order to get to Mars. With the conventional rocket technology, it takes about a year to get to Mars. And they say astronauts' bodies would turn to jello because of space radiation. So they wanna cut in half that trip. And they say they need nuclear reactors to do so. So NASA has put out a request for proposals Corporations have uh, begun uh, sending in their proposals. Uh, they've selected some winners and they're now going to begin flight testing these nuclear reactors just over our heads in lower earth orbit in the coming years. They say they can't do it on the ground because safety regulations are too strong uh, that would prohibit their testing of these nuclear reactors on the ground. And because there are no safety regulations in space in lower Earth orbit, NASA says they want to test these there. It's an obvious danger to all of us. And virtually no politicians in this country, no environmentalists are talking about this whatsoever. So we, the Global Network, have long been complaining about, educating about, organizing about this problem of nuclear power in space. Here, a protest in Darmstadt, Germany, years ago at the European Space Operations Center after one of our annual meetings. This book, Mining the Sky, Dave talked very briefly about the uh, mining of the heavens for profit, untold riches, they say, from the asteroids, comets, and planets. They've mentioned that in 2015, Barack Obama signed a new law giving American corporations the so-called right 
to go out and make land claims on planetary bodies, violating the Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty that say the heavens are the province of all humankind. And so today, plans are to put nuclear mining colonies on the moon and Mars and other planetary bodies. This would require a host of launches of nuclear devices, not only the nuclear rocket with reactors on board of the rocket, but actually uh, launches of uh, nuclear uh, devices to go and uh, establish these mining colonies on the surface of the planetary bodies. So again, a host of these with rockets that blow up from time to time on launch. The rovers that you've heard about that are driving around Mars today, NASA says they're, quote, looking for the origins of life on Mars. But in fact, that's pure deception. What they're doing is they're doing mapping of Mars. They're doing uh, soil identification, soil extraction. And what they're looking for is where the deposits of resources are so they can have a set location for mining of Mars. They say there's magnesium, there's cobalt, there's uranium on Mars. There's helium-3 and water on the moon, and there's gold on asteroids. So this is what NASA and the space program are really doing. They're using your money to set in motion the infrastructure to go out and mine the sky. And as the technology matures, and as the possibility uh, develops to be able to carry out these missions, it's all being privatized. That means that the taxpayers paid the freight, but get none of the bonuses. In fact, legislation has been introduced in Congress to make all profits in space tax exempt. It's not yet passed, but I'm sure that they're working on it. Elon Musk has said that he wants to make Mars more like Earth. It's called terraforming Mars, turning it into a green planet like Earth. And the way to do that, he says, is to explode tens of thousands of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere of Mars, these are t-shirts that are sold by Elon Musk's company, SpaceX. It's more colonization. It's the same old thing. It's the story of 15th century Europe sending out their warships to go around the earth to colonize the planet, to grab resources, to grab uh, slaves, to grab uh, colonies. And then this created the global war system. And this is what we're seeing today that is developing for space. They're moving what I call the bad seed of war and greed and environmental degradation. They're moving it into the heavens. In 1997, we held a press conference in Washington at the uh, at the Media Center in Washington, the Press Club. Uh, this, uh, our news conference was covered on C-SPAN, the uh, cable television uh, channel that reports all government activities. Uh, Michio Kaku, very, become very famous now in recent years, was there speaking out, uh, out against the launch of Cassini. Carl Grossman, the journalism professor, uh, on the left side of the panel there waiting to speak. Uh, he was one of the founders in the Global Network when we created it in 1992. Cassini carried 72 pounds of plutonium into space. In the environmental impact statement for the Cassini mission, NASA acknowledged that if there was a launch explosion and a release of the plutonium as dust, it would be carried by the winds in a 60 mile radius from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. That means north to Daytona Beach, south to Vero Beach, Florida, and westward all the way to Disney World. And everything would become radioactive for tens of thousands of years. The NASA 
environmental impact statement said they would have to go in and remove all the people. They would have to go in and remove all the buildings. They would have to remove all the vegetation. They would have to remove all the animals. Can you imagine the birds, the fish, the alligators, the snakes, the squirrels? And then ultimately they would have to remove the top half inch of topsoil. And a total impossibility, no doubt. This was the Cassini mission. On the left is the plutonium generator being loaded into the spacecraft. This was our protest prior to the launch when we scaled the fence saying that we were going to sit on the launch pad to try to stop the launch. Our campaign went all over the world. On the right, you see even people in Bangladesh, the Astronomical Society, speaking out against the Cassini program. But what we also learned was very important, that even before anything was ever launched, there was already problems from the Cassini mission. It was reported that at Los Alamos labs in New Mexico, where they fabricated the plutonium generators for Cassini, there were 244 cases reported of worker contamination. And we've learned over the years that the Department of Energy that runs these laboratories has a terrible record of community and water contamination when they process uh, nuclear products. So clearly it's not just a launch explosion that we worry about as this space nuclear power system is being ramped up. It's the entire production system that is problematic and dangerous. This is a piece done by a long, long time friend of mine in Florida that really, uh, I think, makes the, the case about the insanity of launching nuclear power into space. This was uh, the thing, uh, the article about Obama's asteroid mining bill allowing American corporations to make land claims on the planetary bodies, again, violating the outer space and the moon treaties that said the planetary bodies are the province of all humankind. Here's Jeff Bezos going up on his blue origin. Uh, just today, I watched a video at, from the Washington National Cathedral where he was honored just in the last couple of days in a big ceremony Giving, it, giving his and other uh, space entrepreneurs the, the uh, grace of God, if you will, from the Washington Cathedral. They're working overtime to sell this stuff to the American people. Dave talked about the uh, ozone depletion from launching these rockets into space, exacerbating climate change. You know, they're talking about launching up to 80,000 mini satellites for 5G in the coming years. Just imagine all of those launches. So in the end, our job, I believe, as human beings on this earth today is to protect the heavens from, again, this bad seed by these industrial corporations who have a spiritual disconnection to life on this earth and to life in space. Space is an environment that needs to be protected because if we do not protect it, it will have severe implications for life on earth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruce. That also was most illuminating. Um, it's hard to sum up what has been said today, and I'll come to some questions in a moment. But it seems to me that we have these cascading climactic tipping points, all of which will be exacerbated by this uh, headless rush into space, by the pollution that will come around it. And I think that, as Kuan said, we too must stop fighting yesterday's wars. We actually have to wake up and start fighting the wars that are coming down the line, the wars against our planet and against the commons, which 
is what the pace is supposed to be. We have to port, force climate cooperation and we have to force space cooperation. It's harder for us because you can't march through space with a placard, but we have to start fighting it nonetheless. Um, I'll just go through, if you don't mind, some of the questions that have been put forward. And it, unless you really want to, it's possible that maybe you just pick one to answer each of you. Um, a, a simple question, but it is worth answering, I think, is uh, why don't we see more collisions if there are so many objects of different sizes in space? I think that means not the wider space, but the very much local um, space in which the satellites are in orbit. Um, and uh, I think this ties in a little bit with the, the weaponization of space and also the uh, commercial activities that might take place in terms of either um, uh, reducing this or collecting it. Uh, who would like to answer that? Yeah, okay, I can have a go. Um, yeah, we do see collisions in space, in fact. Uh, in, and in fact, the, um, there are so many small particles, it doesn't have to be a, a collision with, a, a, you know, two satellites together, although that does occur or has occurred. Uh, just a small piece of metal or something rocketing around at thousands of miles per hour can damage a, a satellite, can go straight through the wall of a satellite. And the, outer, the um, interplanetary space station, which is, um, uh, you know, stationed up in space, which many uh, different nations use, although China is banned from using it by the US, but other nations are involved. Um, that has to be moved from its orbit occasionally to avoid space debris. So it is a problem already, and it's going to become more of a problem. Uh, there's this effect called the Kessler syndrome, where if if debris hits other debris and cascades into a shower and that hits more debris still, creating even more of these small particles that whiz around the earth, then we we'll might get to a point where you can't even travel through all of that debris. Rockets will not be able to move through it without being damaged severely. Uh, so we'll be restricted to the surface of the earth. So it is a problem and commercial interests and the military are both very interested in trying to solve this problem. And there are all kinds of schemes and ideas for vacuuming up some of this debris or for bringing it back into a lower orbit so it comes into the Earth's atmosphere and burns up uh, on re-entry. That itself causes problems too, of course, because when these things burn up, they cause em environmental problems for the, for the atmosphere. So um, the real solution is not to launch so many, so much stuff in the in space in the first place, but only use the, only put things up there that are going to be useful to to everyone, not to just certain individuals. Thank you, Dave. Um, and moving on, I, there is a question about hypersonic weapons, which is a, a word which has only recently come into use. Um, and I read about this in the Space Alert newspaper, which uh, was released just a few weeks ago, which other people might want to go and have a look at. Well, it's highly informative. And the question is, what is the difference between drone missiles and hypersonic weapons in the killing of people? Can anybody answer that one? And uh, mute yourself, if possible, please. Well, uh, Kuhan is slow to jump in. She wrote a brilliant uh, front page story in our last newspaper, Space Alert. If you go to our website, spaceforpeace.org, uh, we have a newsletter section. You can re read our newsletter there. But hypersonics are really, they've been created to get around the U.S. missile defense system. We didn't talk much about it today, but we should. Uh, the United States has refuse to renounce first strike attack. Russia and China have long ago done so. And so the United States Space Command for many years has been wargaming, computer wargaming, first strike attack on Russia and China. 
And after they launched the first strike attack, Russia and China then obviously would fire a retaliatory strike. And it is then that the US so-called missile defense system, the shield is used to pick off any retaliatory strikes. And so Washington has been surrounding Russia and China uh, with so-called missile defense systems based on Navy Aegis destroyers, interceptor missiles on those Navy warships that are made here where I live in Bath, Maine, also on ground-based launchers uh, throughout the Asia Pacific, throughout uh, uh, Eastern Europe and other such places. And as a result of that, Russia and China said, we're now vulnerable to a first strike attack. And so they've been working on hypersonics that would fly at 25, uh, 20 to 25 times the speed of sound and essentially fly around, fly around US missile defense shield that would be launched after a US first strike attack. So the US has created this arms race. I must also say that the United States has refused since 1984 to negotiate at the UN a new ban on weapons in space. Every year, Russia and China introduce a thing called PEROS, prevention of an arms race in outer space. Get rid of uh, you know, these weapons before we have this arms race. Close the door to the barn before the horse gets out. But the US and Israel since 1984 have annually been blocking this treaty at the United Nations. Why? Because the United States always has intended to control and dominate space. Thank you, Bruce. I think that actually also answers another question further down the line. Um, the, um, the time is now four minutes past five Eastern time. So our hour is just about up. I think uh, we could ask this other question that is here, and I don't know who would be able to answer it, about Amazon employees. Are they refusing to work on Jedi, just as some are refusing to work on the Nimbus for Israel? And do they even know about it? Dave, you, you want to try that one? I don't really know the answer to that. I know that uh, there have been some uh, strikes <coughs> uh, amongst uh, Amazon uh, employees for working on some artificial intelligence systems. And uh, it has changed the policy to some extent, around, well, at least as far as we can see, uh, to some extent. I don't know if it was on this specific um, uh, project though on this program um, on Jedi it may have been the one that was mentioned here Nimbus but I think uh, it, it is really that's the way to go to try to get employees to understand what it is they're doing to be aware of what the consequences of their work is and then get them to reevaluate what they are what they are actually doing it's the way I came into the peace movement I started working at the Ministry of Defense actually um, for a very short time, but soon realized this wasn't the way to go. This isn't the way to save the planet. And the way to save the planet is really to change the way that things uh, are structured at the moment. So I left, but you need to become aware of what you're doing and you need to have people there who can help you go through periods of time like that when you're re reassessing your, your own kind of uh, futures, I guess, really. Thank you, that was useful. Right, um, now I'd like to ask each of our participants here, each of our speakers, if they have something they would like to add. And could I start with Kuhan, please? Thank you, Pippa. Well, your statement about uh, how space is a place where we, we really can't pick it with signs and protest and march. However, once we realize that the Pacific and the ocean is an absolute hand in glove essential component of the space war infrastructure, what we can do is we can support the thousands of communities and islands across the Pacific 
who are calling for decolonization so that they have control over how their islands are used. Now, there are islands and countries in the Asia Pacific who are client states of the US, like, is it the Federated States of Micronesia or one of those small countries that was, for example, the only nation to vote at the UN in favor of war in Iraq? Yes, we have those client state relationships with the, with the US. But we also have places like Guam, the Mariana Islands, where the highest concentration of militarization in relation to this new way of war is taking place. And the reason, one of the reasons it's the highest concentration is because they enjoy absolutely no rights of sovereignty. They're subjects. They're basically owned by the United States. And they absolutely have been fighting what's going on in the militarization of their island that's directly essential to the forward movement of, of um, the militarization of outer space. So if we defend the oceans, space war cannot happen because that's where the infrastructure is all being set up. And I'd like to just let people know that the ocean is not uh, a negative space. And I often compare it to Asian calligraphy, where unlike in European art, where you've got the subject in the foreground and the background is rather insignificant. Well, in Asian calligraphy, the negative space is just as significant as the positive space, as that, as that bold uh, black brush stroke on the, on the, the white canvas. Well, the ocean, if you look at, ge ge one could say geographically make the same comparison where we get so used to and the people in power are so used to looking at the land as all that's mad that matters when in fact the ocean matters and the military realizes this and they are using it to, um, they are using the inability of Western minds to perceive of the oceans as significant. They are using that against the Western activists to exploit it invisibly and um, move forward with installing their infrastructure for war in space. Thank you very much. That was very important. Um, Bruce, could I come to you next? Yes. Or anything you. that you feel is left unsaid? Just a couple quick points. I saw a question about the indoctrination of children. Uh, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, space camps are being established around the country and around the world where children are indoctrinated at a very young age. I'll never forget going to a conference at the Space Center in Florida many years ago. I went to a workshop on Mars and who is running the workshop on Mars? The guy that ran the tourist facility at the Space Center. And he said that we're doing a whole new renovation of the Space Center on a Mars theme. He said, because in 20 years, all these kids we bring in here from public schools are going to be taxpayers, and we want them to support everything Mars. So this is where they are going. They're way ahead of us. Um, people, most people don't know the things we're talking about today. Even within the progressive community, it's really hard to reach through uh, and get this word out to people. So we do appreciate anything you can do to share this with others. I want to just say finally, when you're gonna launch 80,000 mini satellites in the coming years, guess what? You need more launch facilities. So we're seeing a virtual explosion of proposals and new construction of launch sites all over the world. I notice there are a couple people on this Zoom from New Zealand. In New Zealand, there's a place called Rocket Lab. The people in New Zealand were promised that Rocket Lab was only going to launch civilian launches. Lockheed Martin has taken it over, and now virtually everything they are doing is launching U.S. military satellites. And again, go to our recent uh, Space Alert newspaper, and we have a double-page spread on launch uh, battles going on now in Michigan, in Georgia, in Papua, 
in Scotland, you know, many places around the world, these things are popping up because these corporations need more launch facilities. And what they do is they come in and they tell people it's going to be safe, it's going to be civilian, it's going to be not going to hurt the environment whatsoever, and we're going to create a lot of jobs. Well, just ask the people in Kodiak Island, Alaska, that's famous for bears, fish, and eagles. And what they learned was that this, first of all, it wasn't civilian. It's been all U.S. military launches. Even Israel tested their, their uh, missile defense system there. And India will soon be launching from Kodiak Island, Alaska. And they've had a number of, of accidents that have polluted the pristine waters around there. So uh, we need to spread this information as much as possible. Thank you again. Thank you, Bruce. And Dave, are there any last words from you? Please unmute. Just a few, a few quick, uh, quick ones. Um, just that every year um, we have something called Keep Space for Peace Week, uh, the beginning of October. Uh, if you check on our website, you'll see information about it. And in 1999, the United Nations General Assembly declared this week as um, World Space Week to celebrate the contributions of space science and technology to the betterment of the human condition. And we're asking people at that time in, August, in October to recognize that we, we should actually be keeping space for peace. So it's an opportunity really for people to organize uh, and to gather around local places where aerospace um, space corporations are are working, where there are bases, where there are, the, there are these spaceports, whatever it might be. And we can connect now internationally through the internet to let other people know that we're there. It doesn't have to be a huge presence, really. It just needs to for the world to see that there are lots of people involved in the protest against the militarization of space. So please join us, uh, sign up, um, get some people, get some placards, and come along, you've got, long, you've got a long time to prepare for this now in October. So uh, there's no excuses for not being there next year. Um, hope to see you online, thanks. Well, what can I say? Thank you to our panelists. Um, I think this is a very important webinar. And thank you to all our participants who have stayed with us, um, which shows just how riveting this information has been. Please don't forget about this webinar when we switch it off. Please don't forget about it when it comes to an end. Please use it and reuse it. This is vitally important material and I think one of the most important webinars of our time. So my love to all who listened and my love to all who have taken part as panelists, you have truly uplifted our futures by your knowledge and your delivery here today. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Joe.